Please be seated and let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for your trustworthiness that we can indeed trust you, cast ourselves upon you in times of blessing, in times of deep darkness and trial, and even at the threshold of death, we can trust you. You will carry us safely into your arms forever. There is no one like you. And we praise you for your word, that it reveals you, that we can see you for who you truly are, what you are like, and what it is like to live under your salvation care. We thank you for your son. Would you open our eyes so that we might see him more clearly today? And we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, before we dig into um, Psalm 23 this morning, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on our family and um, on Kim specifically. And um, for those of you who, who may not know, my wife Kim um, had two breast cancer surgeries in January, and we have just finished five months of chemotherapy. We she, um, I get to be her friend that goes along with her everywhere. Um, and we right now are in a, a few week break and rest from that chemotherapy and um, before about a six week stint of radiation begins for her in August. Lord willing, that will be finished up in September sometime and uh, we'll Everything seems to be on track. Her treatment plan is, is on track going forward. And, and we just want you to know, we both want you to know, our family wants you to know that God's kindness and his love and his strength um, have been experienced in our family through you as a church family. And um, we're so, so thankful for you. Um, every note that you have sent, every card you have sent, every meal you have made, um, and every chemo day gift bag that my wife opens in the chemo chair has just been um, such an encouragement through a, a difficult trial. It's evidence of God's love for us, and we feel it through you guys, and we're so thankful for that. I um, am thankful also just for being able to step away and to be able, you know, from eldering a little bit and be able to care for my, my wife, and Lord willing, we're kind of stepping me back towards some shepherding, and uh, today is a part of that. So today we get to dig into Psalm 23, but I do not want you to open your Bibles there yet, okay? Let's see, let's see um, how familiar you are with Psalm 23, okay? A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie in green pastures. He leads me still waters, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though, or yea, though I valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they what? Comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed, this is the verse we don't know as well. <laughs> well, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness, mercy will Follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell. All right, let's just close in prayer and go home. <laughs> what, does that, what does that show you? That shows you how familiar those words are, probably some of the most familiar words ever spoken um, by human beings. And generally, traditionally, this psalm has found... Um, a unique place, a special place, a place of primacy on the day that death comes. 
And if, if Hollywood ever puts this psalm in the mouth of an actor, you can bet the scene is a what? A funeral scene, right? This psalm has been on the lips of and in the ears of so many believers as they have crossed over the threshold of death into the presence of Jesus Christ. And indeed, it is uniquely an amazing comfort, and it is the perfect escort for the soul of the one whose life is slipping away. There's no doubt about that. God certainly designed Psalm 23 to be of comfort when that day of death does come near. And, and without taking anything away from that, I hope this morning and, and Lord willing next week that you will discover that Psalm 23 is also, maybe even more so, a psalm of the present for today. It's not just for the future day when death comes. When life is trickling its last drops out before you, you will indeed, if you are able, you will reach for this psalm one day. But you need to reach for it today. Psalm 23 is not merely a retirement fund, a 401k that you know is there, but you shouldn't access it yet or benefit from it yet. It's more like your daily checking account. You need it today. You're going to access it today. You're going to spend from it today. Psalm 23's um, placement in the psaltery uh, with its surrounding neighbor psalms actually highlights its present emphasis that it indeed has. Just look back at Psalm 22 for a moment at verse 1. You know these favorite words, uh, famous words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's all about Messiah's cross, right? Look over to Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10. That has the emphasis on the king of glory. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts. He is the king of glory. That's all about Messiah's crown. And from the believer's perspective today, we look to the past to see Messiah's cross, and his suffering, Psalm 22. And from our perspective today, we look forward to the future and we anticipate Messiah's crown when he comes to reign, Psalm 24. But what about Messiah today? Today, each week, we look to Messiah's crook, his shepherd's crook, to remind ourselves daily, to remind ourselves presently of the shepherd character and care of our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. So Psalm 23 is a psalm for your now. Reach for it every day. And it doesn't matter what kind of day today is for you. If today is the day before an unseen, unexpected trial comes, you can be assured that Psalm 23 will tell you who you will find your God to be when that trial comes. And if today is, is just another very long day in the midst of a very long trial, Psalm 23 provides for you the truth about your good shepherd that you must cling to by faith again today and all of his benefits. And if today is the day of deliverance from your difficult trial, Psalm 23 provides for you the words of worship to express to God from a thankful heart. And the very language of Psalm 23, as you will see from our exposition of it, it, it brings clarity to this. So you're at school, you're at work, you're in the nursery with kids at home, you're in the hospital, you're in church family life together here. Our good shepherd in Psalm 23, he, he must be in your sights today. But when you think of Psalm 23, don't just think about God as your shepherd because there is another presentation of him in Psalm 23 towards the end in verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have a house 
Yahweh. God is also your host, showing you his hospitality, his favor. He's honoring David. He's vindicating David right in the presence of his enemies. He's giving him his abundance, a cup overflowing. As David thinks on his God, he draws on familiar themes and motifs from his own life that help him to express what he thinks God is like and, and what it's like to be under his good care. David once was a shepherd boy who has now become the king of a nation. And he knows what it's like to be among the sheep and to be a shepherd And he knows what it's like to host and honor and spoil a guest. And we should pause just right there for a moment and think about what David is doing in Psalm 23. And I want you to reflect on this with me a little bit this morning just by way of introduction. David thought about Yahweh a lot. He thought about God a lot. He took time... He labored to consider, what is he like? David then also searched for ways to describe what his life, what his experience was like under the care of that God. This is what God is like, and this is what it's like to be under his excellent salvation care. And Psalm 23 is an expression of that. So many of the Psalms are expressions like that. Here's what God is like, and here's what it's like to be under his care. The question is, what about you and what about me? Do do you purposefully slow down enough to just think about who God is? And what God is like. Do you pause your busy self and do you postpone the impending demands on you from the day long enough to prayerfully consider what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is and what he is like? Do you slow down yourself enough? Do you open your Bible long enough to discover who he is and what he is like and then Do you ever affirm in prayer, yes, Lord Jesus, indeed, you are my good shepherd? Do you prayerfully pause long enough to consider and try to find words to describe and declare what it's like to be saved under Jesus Christ? You know, what you currently think about Jesus Christ is an indicator of your spiritual condition and your spiritual maturity. If you don't think very often about Jesus Christ and and you don't have maybe very many words to describe what he's like, well, what does that say about your relationship with him, to him? Do you want it to stay that way? And what you currently have to say about what it's like to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what it's like to live under his salvation care, that also is an indicator of your spiritual condition, your spiritual maturity. What are you able to say right now if someone asked you, hey, what's it like to be saved by Jesus Christ? What's it like? First off, you'd probably fall over dead if somebody did ask you that, because nobody asks that, it seems. But what would you say? What is it like to be saved by Jesus Christ? What is it like to live under his lordship? You see, once that question opens the valve of your heart and of your mind, what comes out? A trickle? The 
Does a fire hose open up? And it's not about having tons of words to say, look, Psalm 23 is so short. It, there's not a ton of words, but they're deep words. There's deep thought there. And we can learn from David what he's doing in Psalm 23. We can learn to slow down. We can learn to prayerfully meditate on who God is, to meditate on what he is like, and to give careful thought to what it's like to live under Jesus Christ's salvation care. And, and notice this in Psalm 23. Tied to this meditation on who God is that is in the psalm and what he's like and what it's like to live under his salvation care is actually a worshipful intensification that takes place in the psalm. And the intensification that happens in the psalm is a good model for you and for me to follow in our own worshipful and prayerful pursuit of Jesus Christ through his word. Notice how the pronouns change Specifically, look at 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Watch this. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. He restores my soul. He guides me for his namesake. David is declaring what God is like and what it's like to be under his salvation care. And he's declaring it to others, to us, the readers, to anybody who will listen to him, who will hear what David thinks Yahweh is like as a shepherd. But notice how David does not remain content to declare these truths to just you or me. In thinking about Yahweh, in thinking about what he's like and what it's like to be under his salvation care, David eventually turns directly to Yahweh. He leaves you and me off to the side, and he worshipfully and prayerfully declares to God himself what he knows to be true about him. Look at verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. He turns his attention directly to Yahweh. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. That is the pattern to emulate as a believer. When your Bible is open. Do you ever do this as you are reading, as you're prayerfully, worshipfully thinking about God in his word? When we have our Bibles open and we are prayerfully and worshipfully considering the truth about God in the Bible, we might start, a good place to start is by thinking, declaring, journaling statements like, he is like this, he is like that. He does this for his children. He doesn't do this towards his children. Do that long enough prayerfully, worshipfully enough, and you, like David, you won't remain content to not speak, to not journal directly, to not declare directly to God himself what you think about him. You will worshipfully tell God yourself, you'll affirm to him that he is indeed all that his word declares him to be to you. You will affirm that Indeed, what his word says it is like to be saved under Jesus Christ is true. You'll want to tell him. You can reach a place where you will prayerfully and worshipfully speak back to God. You'll, you'll journal to God. You'll declare to God the very truth about him that he wrote to you in his Bible. We have um, two discipleship ministries that Scott mentioned earlier um, in the announcement part of our service this morning. Two discipleship ministries that specifically and primarily want to help believers in Jesus Christ grow in this very prayerful, worshipful pursuit of Jesus Christ through the scriptures. And that's Build for the Men and Wellspring for the Women. What we try to do is learn how with our Bibles open to fill our hearts and our minds with truth about God from his word so that we can then open our mouths 
and in worshipful, prayerful response to God, declaring to him what he's like and how good it is to be under his care. Before we believers try to go and do anything for Christ, to do anything for the gospel, should we not first be this kind of believer under Jesus Christ? Like David was with Yahweh, we can and must be with Jesus Christ. He's the good shepherd. And he has a good table that we just ate at. And it's good to be under his salvation care. And we should know that better and better and better as we get older and walk longer with him. And we should be able to articulate that better and better and better over time. I would encourage you to sign up for those two ministries as soon as you can. Now, this morning, let's turn our attention just to the structure of the psalm. I'm going to give you an introduction to it this morning. I asked Smed if I could have the pulpit next Sunday, and he said no, so we're going to go to about one. And um, just kidding. that's not true. We're going to do this in two parts. But I, so if you're really worried, like he hasn't even started with verse one yet, because that's what I do. When I listen to somebody preach, I'm thinking time, okay? <laughs> and you might be thinking, this is going to be the longest day of my life. It's not. Um, but I want to just give you, I want to spend time introducing this psalm to you. I, I want to introduce you to a friend you know very well. And maybe you'll be surprised at what you learn about this psalm. But look at Psalm 23. And I, I want to familiarize ourselves with it before we walk through it verse by verse. Um, we're going to look at this psalm through three declarations that David made concerning what it's like to live under the shepherding care of Yahweh and what it's like to be the honored guest of the host Yahweh at his table. And, and, and David made three I statements which are worshipful declarations of what it's like to live under the salvation care of God. I'm giving you the whole outline at once. You see it up there. So you can first just kind of see the roadmap of where we're going. And then we'll start working through it today a little bit. We'll probably just do verse one today. But David declared first this. He declared God's abounding provision, God's abounding provision as his shepherd. And this is based on David's declaration at the end of verse one when he says, I shall not want. There is such an abounding care from his shepherd Yahweh that David declares, I shall not want. And probably the way to give the better sense would be to say it this way, I lack nothing. Meaning, I lack nothing under his care as shepherd. Presently, right now, I lack nothing. It's probably better to translate with a present sense. The second declaration that David made is in verse 4. And he declares God's safeguarding presence as his shepherd. And this is based on David's I statement in the middle of verse 4, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Yahweh is present with David, and his declaration is that he is safeguarded by him, so much so that evil is near, but he's not afraid of it. Now, if you'll notice at the beginning of verse 4, there's actually another I statement, but it's not exactly like the other ones. It's the statement, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But that I statement, that declaration is not like the others, which more directly speak to the benefits from God's care over him. It's simply an I statement about the difficulties that sometimes indeed do come in life. So David declared first, God's abounding provision as his shepherd, I, I, I lack nothing. And then he declares God's safeguarding presence, I, I fear no evil. And thirdly, David declared God's enticing pursuit as his host. The motif shifts from Yahweh as shepherd in verse 5 to Yahweh as a host in a house who's welcoming David. He's, he's uh, honoring David. Yahweh is vindicating David in the presence of his enemies. 
And this declaration is based on David's last I statement in verse 6. I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Probably a better sense is not to dwell in the house, but to return. You'll probably even see that in your margin. I will return to the house of Yahweh. And forever is better translated just as for length of days. However long my days stretch out. So the better translation would be, I will return again and again to the house of Yahweh for the length of days I have. That's quite a declaration to make about what it's like to be spoiled as Yahweh's guest in salvation. David was pursued by goodness and loving kindness, the goodness and loving kindness of Yahweh, his host, in such a way that David declared that he couldn't stay away. He couldn't stay away, but he would keep coming back for more. God's pursuit of him was enticing. He wanted to come back for more. David enjoyed being pursued by Yahweh. And so he declared he would keep coming back for more of that special care from Yahweh. All right, so that's the whole of the psalm. That's what we'll be looking at together. Now, let's today first just scratch the surface on the first one. Number one, David declared God's abounding provision as his shepherd. And again, this declaration is based on the I statement at the end of verse 1, I shall not want, or I am lacking nothing. God's shepherd character and God's shepherd care was so abundant that David could not think of what he lacked under that God. He didn't have a deficit in his life. It starts off, verse 1, Yahweh. You see that all caps of the word Lord. That's that special name of God who is in covenant relationship with Israel. That God is the always eternally existent one. He is I am. He is the always has been God. He is the always is God. And he is the always will be God. In other words, he's the inexhaustible God. There's never been a time when he hasn't been God. He is the self-sufficient God. He is the God who made everything outside of him and provides for it and sustains it and owns it all. He is the God who himself does not need a shepherd to watch over him and he does not need a host to provide for him and spoil him. This God, Yahweh, is the God that David had given a lot of thought to. A lot of thought to. That is the God David has lots to say about. Well, what is he like? Yahweh is my shepherd. And and upon saying Yahweh is my shepherd, David is immediately, immediately saying something indirectly about himself too. What's he saying about himself? I am his sheep. (laughs) He is my shepherd, and that means I am his sheep. And David knew that the shepherd has to live among his sheep. Listen, this is so hard. We live, we're urban people. We we have no idea. We have to read books to find out this kind of stuff. But a, a shepherd can't live on a distant hill away from the sheep. A shepherd can't command them from an office in a nondescript building. A shepherd doesn't send to the sheep daily notifications or text reminders. He can't manage them remotely from some other location. Being a shepherd requires an intimate awareness with, familiarity with the sheep. And David knew that from his earliest days as a shepherd boy. There's actually a very sweet relationship that exists between the sheep and their shepherd. And Jesus said that much, did he not? Did he not speak about the familiarity he has with his sheep and they with him when he said, they know my voice? 
We're like this. They know me. He's among his sheep because he's a good shepherd. That's a sweet, intimate relationship that the believer has with Jesus, the good shepherd. And, and why is the shepherd so near to his sheep? Well, they're resume enhancers, don't you know? No, they're not. Sheep do not bring a whole lot of benefit. In fact, they just create trouble for the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't hang out and draw near to the sheep because they're cool. The shepherd doesn't get a lot of likes for having them. Shepherds don't draw near to their sheep because they're appealing. He does so because they're so desperately needy. They're defenseless. They're directionless. And yes, sheep are stupid. That's an appropriate use of that word in that context. So kids at home, um, I've used that word before, and somebody went home and told their dad that I used the S word. (laughs) And that's okay. That's an appropriate use of the word stupid in this context. And think on this. Think about the God that David's saying this about. He is the inexhaustible, eternally existent, all-sufficient God who needs nobody over him, needs nobody to provide for him. He is Yahweh, and that God has no hesitation to be near to those who are completely unlike him and who trouble him. We are completely unlike him, and we are in so much need of him. And he is near us as a shepherd in Jesus Christ. And David understood this sheep-shepherd relationship. Philip Keller has a, a really good book on Psalm 23. It's called The Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. He says this, Sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require, more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. It is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Our mass mind, our mob instincts, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. Yet, despite these adverse characteristics, Christ chooses us. He buys us. He calls us by name. He makes us his own and delights in caring for us as the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Why is he near us? Not because we are good, but because he is good. He is the good shepherd. Psalm 23, verse 1, and David, the sheep believer, says, Yahweh is my shepherd, not just the shepherd or a shepherd. This was personal for David. And Yahweh is the shepherd right now to me, David says. He is always in my moment as my shepherd. And upon that reflection about Yahweh, what does David declare? I am shall not want. The context probably calls for the present tense, not the future. David declares, I do not lack a thing. I lack nothing. I am lacking nothing. And again, when the true believer in Jesus Christ contemplates who God is, contemplates what he is like, and what it's like to live under his salvation care, The believer cannot find a deficit in his life. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. Let me show you this. Deuteronomy 2, verse 7. Um, Context is Moses is with Israel on the plains of Moab. Towards the end of the 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, he's preaching the law to them a second time, and he's rehearsing their wanderings in the wilderness and what God was like to them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. Here's what he says to the nation. For Yahweh your God has blessed you in all that you have done. 
He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness because he was a shepherd. He was there with them. These 40 years, Yahweh your God has been with you. And what does he say? You have not lacked a thing. And what David knew to be true there of Israel corporately with Yahweh, he was experiencing on a daily basis personally with Yahweh. I am lacking nothing. He's my shepherd. Listen, left to ourselves, outside of Christ's shepherd character, outside of his care, away from Christ's shepherd character and care, we have only deficits. We lack everything we need. Let me give you Jesus' own words. Turn to Matthew chapter 9 for a moment. Matthew 9, some very familiar words from Jesus about what he saw in people, what he sees in us. Apart from Jesus Christ, we have nothing but need. We are lacking everything. We have deficits. Here's Jesus, Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. These people were under the curse of God. Seeing the people. What happened? Seeing the people. He felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were despised distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. They did not have him. He's Messiah. They were a mess. He was touching unclean people, sick people, dying people, dead people. He knew they were without him. He knew they were without a shepherd. Go just a couple chapters to the right to Matthew 11, verse 28. More familiar words from Jesus. He turns to those kind of people. What does he say to them? Come to me, 1128. Come to me, all who are what? Weary, burdened down, heavy laden. Listen, come to me. You're over there. I'm over here. You're not with me. There's space between us, and you need to come to me. And who am I talking to? I'm talking to those of you who have come to the enlightenment, the awareness that you are weary and you are heavy laden without me. You have deficits. You have nothing without me. Come. Come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You see, you will follow him. He will be your Lord. He will control you. And learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We are heavy Laden, we are weary, we are burdened as we live our lives apart from him. We have deficits everywhere of every possible kind. But once we belong to the eternally existing, covenant-making, promise-keeping, self-sufficient Messiah Jesus, who is the good shepherd, once we belong to him, we have no deficits ever at all. None. David the believer says such in his day. David says something like, you know, let me, let me think about this for a minute. I've, 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 I've given thought to what Yahweh is like, and I've declared that. Now, let me give some thought to what I lack. What are the deficits in my life? Let me think. Uh, Psalm 23, verse 2, he, he, he makes me lie down. Verse 2, he leads me beside quiet water. So I'm giving thought to my deficits. What are they? Well, I'm thinking, I'm looking at him. He, he makes me. He leads me. He restores my soul. He guides me. I, I have no lack. I lack nothing. Do you know what that is evidence of? That is evidence of of a transformed heart and mind. That is the fruit of conversion. That is the fruit of being born again. Because 
When you are lost in slavery to your sin, when you are dispirited, when you are distressed, when you are cast down like a, like a, a sheep without a shepherd, when you are weary and heavy laden under the bondage of your own sin, how you determine what a deficit is, how you define what a deficit is in your life is very, very different from what David just did. Do you understand that? How an unbeliever determines if there's any deficits in his life is very, it's a very different process and measurement process than the way a believer measures whether or not there are deficits in his or her life. Lost under the slavery of our own sin, we look at what the world says is necessary and we listen to what our sin and our lustful passions scream to us is necessary and we sadly conclude, I have huge deficits. I'm burdened. I'm cast down. I am in want. I lack. But... Upon being saved by Jesus Christ, upon being converted, upon receiving forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ for us, upon being brought into and under his, uh, into his flock and under his care as shepherd, upon seeing with new eyes what he is like, what his shepherd character is and what his uh, shepherding care is like, we don't listen to the world we don't listen to our flesh. We don't listen to our lustful passions to determine if we have deficits anymore. We look somewhere entirely different to measure whether or not we are in lack. We look to God. We look to Christ. What is he like? What, what does he do? What does he not do? What is it like to be under his care? That's how we assess whether or not there is a want or a need or a, a lack in our life, if there's a deficit. Well, he makes everything I need. He leads me everywhere I need to go. He has restored me in every possible way. He guides me in a path of righteousness. I, I can't think of a thing. I cannot think of a thing I lack. I want. It's a very, very different kind of person from who you used to be without Christ, believer. Upon becoming a Christian, you might actually become more impoverished by the world's standards. If you listen to the world and you come to Christ, the world might say, man, you just lost out big time. Your status that you had amongst all those around you is gone. Worldly fame gone. Favor among them gone. Maybe even income diminished. Don't get as many likes anymore on Instagram. You might lose property, you might lose possessions, you might lose friends. Did not Jesus say this? Luke 9, verse 23. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life, save it apart from the shepherd, will actually lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Yeah, you're, you'll lose that and you'll lose everything you are after apart from Jesus Christ. You'll lose it all and the world will tell you that. And your flesh won't like it. Your flesh will never be converted. Your flesh will never agree with you. Your sinful passions will never come around. They will always speak against you and what you're doing in Christ. But you don't listen there anymore. Because you realize you just gained a life in Christ that you could have never imagined. You will look at Jesus Christ. You will look at what he is like. 
you will look at what he does for you and you will conclude, I am not lacking anything. That's evidence of a complete change of life because it's evidence of a complete change of measurement process of determining what's a deficit in my life and what's not. What, what if you, what if we just found out all of us just ate our last meal? Something's gonna happen in the next five minutes and we will never eat again. All of this in Jesus too, still? We, we, we lack nothing, we have everything we need. If God's goal for you and me is that he, his goal is that he's going to maintain this comfy, cush life for us, and we just ate our last meal, he failed. But that is not his goal. His goal is to bring us safely home to him. You lack nothing for it. Paul said it this way, Philippians 121, to live is a three-car garage, three cars, 4.5 kids. No, to live is what? Christ. And dying's even better. Why? Because you get Christ in a way that you don't even get him now. Second Peter 1.3. You can write it down. I'll read it for you. seeing that his divine power has granted to us almost everything pertaining to life and godliness. Almost. But I, there's this thing that I've been really wanting that I don't, no. Um, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Do you believe that? You have everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have no deficits. I'm not asking if you think you're making enough money. I'm not asking, I'm not telling you, maybe, maybe you need to go get another job to help take care of your family. That's not the issue. But you lack nothing that you need for life and godliness. Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with almost every spiritual blessing in the heaven. No, he has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and he has blessed us, given us those things in Christ. In having the good shepherd, you have all of those blessings. So what am I lacking as a believer in Jesus Christ? Nothing. Whatever you lose in this life that is not Jesus will never put you in want, believer. That's good news. That's good news before the trial hits. That's good news in the trial as God takes away the things and the ones that you love. It's good news after. It's good news for today in the present. What will you lack if you lose everything but still have Jesus? Nothing. How have you been assessing what your deficits are in your life lately? It's probably a good way for us to think about our lives as we finish out here. How have you been going about the process of measuring deficits in your life? What does that way of assessing them reveal about where you're at spiritually? Believer, listen. I, I want to tell you this. If you've been taking your eyes off of Jesus lately you've probably been feeling like you've got some holes because that's what happens. <laughs> when you take your eyes off of your Savior and you look at other places and you listen to other messages from the world, the flesh, and your sinful passions, you start seeing big holes. If you've been taking your eyes off of him, let Psalm 23 turn you back to him to a more faithful pursuit of Jesus Christ. 
refresh your mind, refresh your heart again and again with how good it is to be under his salvation care. No matter how far you've strayed, it's always one step back. Come back. Maybe you've this morning concluded that you have not yet ever come to Christ. You have not yet trusted in him alone for forgiveness of sin. You have not yet received that transformed life that we just talked about. You are indeed like a sheep without a shepherd. You are a sheep without a shepherd. You are weary and you are heavy laden because you are without Christ. Please come to him today. Come to him today. Come to him in faith. Turn away from yourself. Do not trust in yourself any longer. Look where it's gotten you. Trust him to pay the penalty of God's wrath in your place and begin a new life with him that you could have never imagined. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you for caring for us as you do, as you have been, as we know you will, because you are never changing towards us in your love. That doesn't mean that a valley of the shadow of death or deep darkness won't come. It might indeed come, but you will be with us. We have so much to gain from this psalm. We have so much to learn about you and we have so much to offer back to you in praise about who you are and what it's like to live under your care. Would you open, open our hearts and fill them first with these truths about you and then op- open our mouths that we might declare to you in worship and in prayer what we think of you and what you are like and what it's like to be saved by you in Jesus Christ. Father, take that soul that is weary and heavy laden this morning without Jesus, draw them to your son, the one you lifted up on a cross to die for sinners just like them. We were once that way and now we have been changed. How good it is to be under your love and your care and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.